recording. Okay, so it's Tuesday, May 14th, meeting of the OSE dev team. Only a few people on today. Uh, a couple of announcements for me are, uh, so one big piece of news is, of course, the the open source microfactory Steam Camp. So an experimental camp on nine-day event. That's our next big event. Uh, some new things happening in there as we continue to work on a 3D printer and get that out to <clears throat> out to production. And also I'm continuing in the background here meeting with uh, my mentor on, on marketing and that is with respect to the developing the cordless drill incentive challenge. So that's, uh, let me see if I can get my camera on here. That. Okay, that's that's better. Um, so I want to update a little bit on the on the cordless drill challenge. That's that's one of the things. Um, so using Hero X, if you've heard about Hero X, uh, it's kind of a very much an interesting platform. So HeroX.com, and we're planning on using that for design challenge incentive challenge where I actually put up a, a big monetary reward for apps and collaborative open source development. And one of the first things to note as always is um, there's a few things out there in the world that truly are super collaborative like for example and uh, you know you can look at some challenges that are up there on the uh, Hero X platform. One thing I took a look at was Bo Flysically uh, designing a sink person vertical takeoff landing basically a human sized uh, drone uh, where Boeing is offering for example two million dollars to do that and um, if you look at the structure the way they do it there's rules of the game that, and the platform is pretty good so I'm, I'm pleased with with Hero X uh, I've talked to the Hero X people uh, last year already about this as we were starting to talk about the uh, the OSC version of the design kind of. The thing to point out is, uh, how do we get to large collaborative development? I mean, this is one of the things you can do is to offer a prize where other people are incentivized to uh, contribute. So it's really about. Actually, let me let me share my screen here. So it's. Let's share. So if you take a look at, uh, you know, for example, the Star Wars challenge right here the idea is, is devising proper incentive structure for a lot of people to collaborate on and that's a magic so so I'm part of our blocking which you can see on a development team and it's hard to get people to, to collaborate and you have to have a common language and everything but I think like incentive price has been proven to, to, to be a good format for development and we're hoping to push the limits on that so um, but for us, it's going to be different. We're going to put different rules of the game. Like, if you notice any challenge on there, I bet you there's not a single one, and I haven't looked at all of them, but I would seriously doubt there's a single one where it's uh, an effort to where the intellectual property is open to everybody, or the goals are uh, distributed, kind of like what we talk about. Uh, open source technology that everybody contributes to something and everyone has that so it's essentially public interest development so for example go apply uh, in that example the people who contribute the winning designs they actually own the design so it's, it's got nothing to do with open source right um i mean it's a collaborative platform but collaborative is not necessarily open and open source <laughs> Actually, the way around is true too. Open source is not necessarily collaborative. We can be open source and really not collaborate um, in terms of the development process. You know, most most people in a, in a open source world right now, they, they kind of go into a corner, push their results, and open them up to the world. But one the gap in there is also, well, how do you get people involved through the process and so forth? So we're going to both of it. How do you actually make the challenge super collaborative? And by default, of course, all the results are going to be open source. And, and our particular angle on that would be to uh, stay an explicit purpose that we're going to develop a commercial grade cruise drill. And the thing will, uh, with an explicit intent of getting 100 to 200 people actually producing this. So, this is not, not a work in a This requires some serious infrastructure to be built as a result of the 
the challenge part of it is the design, the other part is uh, the enterprise and collaboration infrastructure. If you want to create a model that can be applied to other things. So that's that's actually very exciting as far as what um, what we're doing, the cordless drill challenge. And we're going to get at uh, a first stab of this cordless drill. And actually, it's, we're kind of thinking about it in the background. Like, for example, William from the University Club in London, Ontario, he's basically been working on an electric motor, uh, which he will build out in the uh, micro factory STEM camp, or STEM camp. We kind of should do that to STEAM since it's more of design, so art and design, uh, the part of that. But so we're, we're doing a little bit of work in the background. In the STEAM camp, we also, we also do a, a dedicated two days to, to the build of the, the cordless drill, which means Containing the printing with battery pack, with motors, with some little, little bit of electronic control, a charger, and so forth. So uh, let's start on that. Uh, so to move on, I'll go to the sec topic, which is the the STEM cam, the STEAM cam. So let me uh, pull that up. I do want to talk about it. There's a couple of good points, as there is a couple of um, things that we haven't really built before that we will have the opportunity to do so this time around. Uh, so if we go to open source code.org. It's prominent there is open source micro factory steam camp. Um, 45 days. Well, we already got the sign ups. That's pretty good. Um, posted that just a few days ago, so that's, that's looking good. Um, the couple of new things in there. So, so I mentioned one, uh, the DVD simple. I put a picture of it here. So thinking about what's the simplest implementation of a, of a 3D printer that you can do that's a 3 simple, we're going to have an opportunity to build that. We're going to have an opportunity to build larger printers like this one. Uh, we can use our CNC circuit mill doing that. Uh, so the focus will, this is the one inch universal axis, uh, but the focus will be doing large versions of the universal axis. Like everything they did here is primary, well, except for this torch table that we built. Uh, that's the one inch universal axis, but we've been working primarily with the 8 millimeter rods but think about what happens when you scale them up to 1-inch and 2-inch. So we're going to do both of those. We're going to have an opportunity to do the 2-inch universal axis system. That means a carriage. Uh, one of those pieces is going to be at least about 8 inches about um, to handle two, two rods. I mean, it's basically everything just like you see here, the universal axis except this thing, except huge. And when we talk about 2-inch axes, uh, if you look at the first calculation, if you made a 2-foot two, two by 2-foot CNC map, uh, you get half a thousandth accuracy in terms of like, the strength that a deflection that will happen to a uh, two inch rod. We have it in a unit of uh, universal axis configuration. It will deflect about half a thousandth. Not half a thousandth. Uh, no, okay. yeah, no, 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 that's right. That's right. Half a thousandth, so 10 microns, 200 pound first. So that's that's decent. And get us, gets us to. Uh, some basic uh, milling operations that we'll, we'll see how it works. Uh, but the focus is that uh, we will start building the larger things and we'll have all the axes uh, part available. We will have uh, what a little inch rod and, and the ability to make frames because we'll have good welding actually uh, as implied in our fine picture here. There will be time to uh, do some welding so we can build the frames, build the universal axes, and supersize them. And for the one inch axis, we can put on a torch head, so that means mounting a torch handle on that. Uh, we'll probably get to the point of a. Uh, um, I will prepare that we have automatic air solenoid so we can actually have an automatic turn on, which would require auto ignition. We, we can possibly get that, I'm not sure. But we'll definitely have the the axes and everything to basically mount, mount the tool heads, different tool heads, whether it's a router, whether it's a torch head, uh, onto the axis. And for the big two inch version uh, of the mill, heavy duty mill, we were looking at since, since that point, looking like multiple horsepower, uh, kind of force, you can put a big router on that, or we have plenty of hydraulic motors that can run from a power a few, so that means, yeah, that's some serious force. We've got a lot of different hydraulic motors lying around that we can actually dedicate to that. We'll have a, we'll have an electric power cube uh, in the shop, so we can power if we have any hydraulic um, machines. Have One you considered the rotation of the um, linear axis, though? 
because it's weird. Yeah. And uh, with 200 pounds of force on the actual spoon bell, it's going to be a area that was more than half thousand of them to actually even with one inch rods. Like if the axis is rotating around, like I suppose it's a rotational force on the uh, rudder. Uh, I haven't done uh, the specifics for, for one inch, but for two inch, uh, I looked at the, the forces. Yeah, yeah, that looks, looks pretty good. I could do a um, study in fusion actually to determine the. Yeah, I'm talking about. Well, yeah, if you want to take that on, actually put some number to what you're saying, that would be awesome. Because then I can yeah, say. Cool. Yeah, yeah, so if you go ahead and. And that way, when we're actually doing it, we can say, oh, well, our calculations show this. We're getting this in practice, so we're going to get more insight and more learning from that. So that would really be good. And a couple more things. So in, uh, in a workshop, too, we'll, we'll cover some base circuits with a chain. So like the owner transfer method, plus the this is the Halak array motor. This is William yeah. from London and Academy. So we're going to build one of these things. It's basically a three current PLA uh, motor that gets about, I think it's like 600 watts or so. But that's awesome. And besides that, um, we have other options like what else can you mount to one inch universal axis? We can mount uh, a torch head. So another torch, uh, that will be a, a CNC torch table, but, but mount a, a May welder, of which you have a number of May welders here. So as long as you shield the axes from spatter and just turn the thing on, you can be doing three dimensional printing in full metal. So what's relevant for that would be things like sprockets for the tractors. You can definitely do something like that, maybe try that during the workshop. But but that's cool because uh, there's been a lot of examples of people doing the you know mounting the MIG welders on, on axes to make a a so called three dimensional printer out of metal. Uh, but I haven't really seen a lot of people doing that outside of just for experimental purpose. I think for us, the different thing we can do is we're actually going to use it for very practical things like the sprockets, which right now we either torch or uh, weld. But it, it, there's a lot of torching and welding involved because you still have to put a hub on the sprocket and so we can do that in three dimensional printing, like with a maybe probably get good enough to that shape enough so, so with minor, minor refinement that actually would be workable like right off the three printer which will get you like probably like you know, three millimeters maybe like one eighth inch um accuracy like it won't be sub millimeter but it'll be like a, a few millimeters a couple of millimeters um it could be usable for brute force applications like track sprockets and things like that so we'll, we'll see what we can do on that um some of the other things uh workshop will be definitely ex experimenting with gear rounds because uh Gear downs such as uh, planetary gear downs for high torque applications. We can, if, if we've got a big printer, so we're planning on, on doing a big printer that actually uses the super volcano nozzle, which which has 20 pounds of of um, deposition rate of plastic per hour. So you can make like large colors, uh, large couplers. You can make uh, larger planetary gear downs. We can experiment with well, what are the practical limits for what's what's worthwhile using 3D printing and if you do, do gear down applications. Um, let's see what else to be said about this. The, the other focus on this is how our main is different this time around is a lot of times we would do dedicated builds of something, okay, here you go, we're going to build track or something. But this time around we're saying, okay, we've got all these tools and all these materials and you can choose whatever machines you like to get to a decent stick completion. You know, so people will team up and work together on that using our swarm build method while collaborating. So that the hard part is uh, collaboration, but now we've got a in fast internet site, so we've got the one gig uh, fiber. Uh, so we can hopefully do rapid online collaborations, such as using Google Docs for design, th design or like sharing a CAD file where, where people download the CAD file, upload it, download it, upload it, so you can get the version history. Uh, while m working on many many parts using part libraries like we do for um, just like for example um, you know, the 3D V 1904 you see the part libraries well so you can break down workflow in order to involve many people you can break that down into like you see the part library you know say you've got 12 parts for the printer um, 
just for the main main part of the printer. Well, each person can work on an individual file. They can be uploading to the version of history for each thing. Like for example, you, you look at this version of history for final assembly. You know, there's actually a whole bunch here. Like uh, I've been basically saving every version as, and making notes on what's in there. But if you take a look at, for example, uh, well, the D3 final assembly, I know I've done it quite a bit, so look at that string, it's about you know, 30 or 40 files, and you can be doing at the level of final assemblies, you can be doing at the level of individual parts and, and sub-assemblies, so uh, you can, in principle, using the simple method of uh, repository plus part libraries, uh, live editing, in a way you can do a lot, like here, you see a whole session. This is just the main printer body, but down here you see this is all for the control control uh, panel. So you know there's like ten more for the control panel. Then there's a whole bunch like twenty four so four for the heat bed. Uh, frames got three parts. Extruders got like you know, eight or nine parts and so forth. So you can really break that work in a massive way. So we'll explore with how that works because if we do a massive incentive challenge, we're talking about I mean, ideally, we probably have like a thousand people uploading and crazy up and downloading stuff from Wiki because the rules are going to be such that you have to build upon other people's work. Uh, not like typical contests where it's essentially like a bunch of individual teams that don't collaborate. Well, you can have a team, but if people all try to pull the teams together, well, that's obviously hard from a coordination perspective, but, but it could, if possible, it could definitely get you better results instead of people going off on all. All kinds of versions um, individually they can be taking the best from each version and inserting that into a master master thing so so really focus on learning from each other and using each other's parts because that way you can do way more than even if you have a large challenge in many teams you can do way more than many teams can do on their own so, so that's kind of how we're going to look at structuring the, uh, the incentive challenge when we do that and Right now we're looking at uh, actually July of 2020 as the deployment of that. So if you look at, uh, for example, on the uh, incentive challenge page, where else? <laughs> on the incentive challenge page, you, you have the end state. There's a critical path, so there's a whole bunch of stuff. Um, so take a look at the kind of challenge critical path. Um, well, that's not in the end that right now. Let's do that, but basically, um, you can take a look at it. It's the of challenge critical path page on the wiki. Um, look at July 20th for the deployment, and before that, there's a lot of stuff to do. And one thing I definitely wanted to do for the challenge is to um, install a, a stack exchange like instance where you can upvote best technical contributions. Uh, we all stack exchange, right? Um, it's the upvoting platform concept is a very powerful thing and we can really leverage that for development because that uh, from all the knowledge out there, the best filters to the top because it's crowd development people people do vote things up and, and we know that stack exchange is a quite reputable platform and you can find a lot of answers there so we want to try to start doing that for technical development within OSC so that's one of the things to do okay so that kind of summed up um, what I've got so on, uh, on uh, the sticamp camp instead of challenge uh, on the ground here is um, working on a, a refinements on a printer so, so for example uh, a mounting bracket for the axis for the printer where now the frame itself, so you can see this picture, there's corners, 3D printed corners of the frame. And then this mounting bracket actually integrates with that 3D printed corner, so it's got the same root hole. So I have to redesign that, and this, this looks all ripped up and messed up, but uh, the holes are right now in the right positions, but I'll probably got to clean out this file later on. Um, and also, this is a picture of D3 Simple. I didn't show a picture last week, but I do want to bring this up as a as simplest instance of where you take three universal axes and mount them to each other and to a flat platform. So that's cool. I mean, it's simple. It's not going to be super high performance. You can't do like a super large printer because, of course, things get, can be levered. This is going to start drooping on you. But if you get the design, actually, it, it is neat for 
large scalability of the X of the moving bed axis. You know that's not a desirable feature because you can't print whole columnar things on that. But for very flat things, imagine this uh, this flat mounted axis here being very long, that could work because it's mounted very solidly on a base. So the S there will be very robust. Um, so you can this kind of tiny printer design, which typically people make in like you know five by five inches. There's, there's other th other models like this. The printer bot is this style. Um, but you can really extend the X axis in the configuration because it's fairly mounted, so it won't uh, won't be shaking around. But just a concept. But that with the cool thing about this instance is that it's a totally different take on the universal axis, whereas everything else that we're doing there is has got big frames. This is the simplest item without the frames. So it shows you the kind of flexibility that you have using the system. And in this kind of system, there's nothing that tell, says you can't, oh, well, if you mounted one z-axis, we can mount another z-axis on a platform as long as you get that nice triangulation there, that nice support on the bottom piece that we mount to the board. Um, you can get decent Z mounting system. I kind of like how the Prusa works. You've got two Z axes like, mounted you know, vertically. Um, but you can just play around with all kinds of configuration. And I think that's good here is just like the minimal, minimalist, most minimal, but D3 minimal or D3 simple, but minimal uh, complex for a simple machine. That will get you definitely education and some practical printing. Uh, so more. Uh, so you're getting pretty good with your cut now, eh? Yeah, yeah, I mean, did all that. Yeah, yeah, I did this stuff here. Now, yeah, like the cool thing, just you know, just to tell you about uh, the concept, the power of, of pod libraries. I just took three of these axes, um, basically inserted them in this document, drew a board, and took a, the extruder from another thing. So I used all pod libraries, and I was able to do this very simple design. It took me an hour. So that was, that was like cool. Um, you can. Use parts that you know that already work. Like for example, uh, I mean, all these universal axis pieces. There's been many hours upon hours that have gone into their details, but we have that, right? So you can build from that and keep on. So that's the idea. Uh, just more instances of what we can do. Um, and I think I mentioned this last time, so I think I'm gonna stop here and continue uh, with other people. So what else are other people up to? Uh, who wants to well, go next? Okay. Yeah, what's next? Well, I think... I can report on Rugged. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So I've been trying to work on getting a Fusion made for Fusion... Or sorry, a plane made Fusion 360. That will allow me to do the chem programming process uh, a little more effectively. I consulted with Gabriel from Open Source Ecology. He was there in summer 2014. Oh, yeah. Because um, he's a software engineer, right? So... Uh, that helped a lot, mm -hmm. and uh, I contacted some personal developers, just a all over that's going to get back to me on some details, and uh, so yeah, I have been making some progress on that, mm -hmm. but it would be really nice to have somebody who's like, in person, a software engineer, but yeah, it is, it's coming, it's just like a barrier that I, I'm working on, because I know, even if I had piece and lots of time, I would still take a long time to get it done. So, because yeah. of budget along now. Yeah, okay. Um, have you given any thought, any more thought on, uh, you know, the best, best mix of here? We're going to try to do a casting concept. For me casting? Um, the best what for that? No, the best repertory, like the last discussion. Oh, the best repertory. Yeah. Um, what is... Really, only one castable refractory. Well, there's two. Um, the other one is silicon. Uh, sorry, called it silica bonded materials. And uh, those are interesting. But they're kind of, uh, they're not very commonly used. It's like pretty hard to find any information on them. So I think uh, the calcium aluminum cement is a pretty good idea. I think that would really work pretty well. Uh, yeah. Because they have a replica sensor on that type of problem with it, which is some kind of moldable material, which is good for steel cutting. And it's really only those two. There's cutting aluminate cement and the colloidal bonded uh, materials. Because there's only two binders that really stand up to the temperatures involved. That is calcium aluminate cement times colloidal stuff. Colloidal silica, colloidal zirconia, colloidal titania. The different collides can be used. Yeah. 
they all they gel at some point. So let have gelling, and then you have to evaporate the remaining water, so you don't get like vaporization like for the steel, right? Hmm. Very interesting material. So yeah. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Now, what's Gabriel doing? Is he um, is he working right now, or is he still in school? Or? Um, no, he's he's been working and uh, some some projects. He has his uh, home RV apparently. He has that. Um, yeah. Hmm. He was, uh, he worked with Onshape a lot. He uses Onshape for all the development stuff. Yeah. Wasn't exactly clear what he does for a job now, but he definitely is employed. He's got yep. a job and he's got a lot of projects going on. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Alright. Uh, let's move on then. So, um, Abe. Uh, Abe and Ak Abe, do you have anything to pop in? Yeah, um, I've been trying to resolve more of the uh, the CAD for the still kind of just on the general assembly of tube style frame printer. And um, yeah, I was just looking at your CAD earlier and on the collaborative stuff. I guess there's probably some need to, to uh, when I talk about that, I was just looking at your CAD files that were recently updated because uh, I've been mm -hmm. thinking about making different changes to that XY bracket for. More sellability, maybe in the size or frame, or you know, just trying. Yeah. For for the printer that the frame that I'm working on, and so I didn't, I, didn't, I hardly thought about what you were doing with it, but than what I saw before. Uh, so it looks like you use it for different things. Uh, I don't know if you intend to make. I mean, obviously, the 3D printed, so we can make all the versions we want. Yeah. But um, at some point, it probably be good to figure out what the what the uh, Made a design that is all inclusive for as few versions as possible. Right? So, um, I was thinking about putting slots on that just because I was trying to think if the, the there might be some cases where scaling on the tube style frame it might need to be in slightly different uh, positions. Of course, technically, you can make the frame many as you want, just cut the rod length. After that, it's the class that can determine the positions on. on that style, but um, right. uh, lots of ways to make it so that it will mount in various positions, but then that can make the assembly maybe a little more complicated because you have to make sure you get um, correct amount if there's there's you know a little bit of variation in the position. But obviously, another stuff is that I accuracy. Um, I changed a version of that just to line up holes because they were a little off for, um, well, on the top side, the bottom side, you know, it's all, you already had it lining up with the uh, carriage. Um, but whenever there were two brackets opposing each other, they were off from one end to the other. Well, um, so I redid care for that. But I, I see you're also using the bracket for a different amount, and, I, and the other corner bracket, it looked like in the recent CAD uh, for 1902. Yeah, um, yeah. This, this one is, is used for Y to frame and then X to Y. So, are you planning just printing a few versions of that as needed, or well, actually, actually, right now the way I have it, um, if you add a slot in it, is that one of them has a slot for where the wires go through. So, add slot to this, and same one can be used identically in the Y1, Y2, and then X and Y. Uh, the, 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 see, the, the one point I want to emphasize there is that the two holes are more or less symmetric so that this can go on Y1 and Y2. If you have the holes in different locations, there'll be a mirror image and it won't work. So uh, the way it's designed, it gets to be uh, just one for all. That's just easier to tra yeah. track one file as opposed to uh, okay, three. so yeah, I was wondering if the whole size um, would be bigger or slot shaped holes instead of just bolt holes. The, the only issue I thought about on the, um, yeah. let's see, when we were mounted to the carriage, but the top that I thought slot would be kept on the side that mounts to the carriage when you're doing, let's see, the, the, from the y axis. Um, that might. I, depending on how much it might slip around over time or something, if that would really cause it. If we put slots there, then that might... Slide. 
Yeah, eventually, but I, I don't know how likely that is. If it's compressed enough with bolts, um, right. you know, it might not be significant. Yeah, it's all to be to be we have to find that out. But I mean, the quarter inch bolts. I mean, I have hundreds of pounds of clamp force, so um, mm -hmm. yeah, we'll see. But I have not issues any issues of that nature yet. Okay. Um, Axles slipping. Yeah, I guess I'll I'll look closer. At, but um, they're all the same bolt hole sizes that. Uh, that's correct. It's all different sizes of bolt. Do that? No, all the same. It's it's once again all the six millimeter. And, Currently, we're using two bolt sizes, 18 millimeter and 30 millimeter long. So, like you see, that bolt there is long. Other ones are 18, and that's so far sufficient. Okay. Well, I'll just say diameter, yeah, because go through the uh, universal axis parts. Well, we should probably be able to get it to one part, maybe. Um, uh, hopefully, that. <clears throat> uh, like yeah, as long as the hole, uh, like the hole for the wires, you know that's fine. Mm -hmm. It's needed for the other. Um, so yeah, I guess slot or some hole shape that will uh, press. Um, let's see, you did do some thirty pretesting of, of that new uh, axis assembly did an early right? So have you, you printed those toy brackets. It's that yeah. print okay. Yeah, that that works I, well. I noticed you had the, the thicker. I, I guess it prints. Let's see. Does it just? It probably just prints um, supports or something, which doesn't really matter under those um, the uh, thicker protrusions for around the balls. Is that? I printed on the so base here. Printed on that base, the small base, and upstanding vertically, yeah. and not a problem. There's no support because um, those are just quarter-inch holes. So print mm -hmm. that base and then just vertical, and the holes they come out well. They're they're pretty decent, just running vertically like that. But here, the yeah. details, okay, you so see, like, there's the detail. It goes to the corner. And this is the long bolt. The short, the 18 millimeter is just a little too short. Um, we could probably do 20, but see, 18 millimeters is exactly the the width of the universal axis. So this doesn't shoot out of the universal axis. So you don't want to make it more than 18. So that's why. The rationale for 18 is that it just it's flush when you put two clamp shells together for the universal axis. And then we need a 30s for long things. Like, for example, mounting one axis to the other, the next one at a 90 degree angle. Like X to Y, for example. Uh, like, if, if you uh, can go through these bolts, essentially, like in all 33Ds where we go through these bolts into the internal nut catchers of the these, these nut catcher holes inside there. On the end pieces. Um, yeah. I guess the asymmetry you're talking about is uh, there's a reason you've got two holes on one side and a slot on the other. Is that yeah, the actually, asymmetry is, uh, you're, or that you're talking about? Uh, so, so here's the deal. Initially, holes were there when a hole was, when the holes were for a welded frame, but now we're using this location. So, therefore, this wants to be exactly on the bottom. Um, now, that way, if you flip it around 180 degrees, it can go on the other side because it was going to be a mirror image, and mirror image is not the same as a 180 degree flip. So, uh, this this here could could be just a round hole, but I gave a little bit of room in case like we want to get this is still prototyping. So I want to put the hole a little bit further off the edge, not like right on the edge. Like this is like right on the edge there. Uh, so I wanted to. Uh, have a slit so I could put the the hole in the frame just a little bit more to the right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I wonder to make it more universal. I wonder if we'd make a, a an L-shaped slot hole in there. Is it, uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe there's. It looks like there's yeah. a lot of different places. Well, the way to go about this is, uh, and the way I've been doing it is, yeah, you can come up with infinite variations, but uh, the best judge of that is have a purpose, and then when the purpose is clear, have that feature. Um, so once you get to the need for that, you have to put it in, and therefore this thing will have more information in it, will be more, more robust for different uses, but then again, you don't want to put a bunch of uses in there that are never used, so you want to kind of go iteratively on that. Yeah, 
Yeah, I, I, let's see, just trying to think if we can get closer to just one or a few parts that are printed and, yeah. you know, um, but yeah, I mean, it's not hard to print different versions yeah. for different purposes either. Yeah. And here we're doing well. I mean, if you look at this picture right here, there's three parts. There's the motor part, carriage, and piece, corner, and then the bracket. That's all there is for 3D printing in this one. Yeah. So five five print parts plus the end stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in general, I, I like the uh, overhead access, that, getting the access outside if it gives more room. I think that makes sense for the um, pipe style frame. Uh, but it definitely adds more uh, part count, obviously. But it's yeah. through 3D printed parts. And I'm, I think I've got that. that uh, the X axis, the PVC, pretty good. It, it it'll mount those brackets. Uh, uh, get the holes in the right place. It'll it, it looks pretty good. And I kind of moved on to trying to figure out how to do the um, well the, the bed mounting actually because it, it does have to be just like there it has to be uh, raised up quite a bit from the right. yeah. bottom um, kind of to reach the the extruder up there. Right. Um, I think it's an inch and a half. I, I was measuring on that. So I had to do that. And I guess you, you have um, now uh, you put a bunch of plastic parts in there for that. Um, the cat yeah, on that, but yeah, I guess you don't have anything. You don't have anything static on it. So um, that's how I did it. Now I, for the next version, if you look at the bed, the bed is gonna be. It's gonna have a stand up because it's an insulated bed that that. Um, it's got its own height, so if you go to 1904, so the new bed has got height to it, it's one and a half inches already, so, um, you take a look at the heat bed here, yeah, it's this thing here, where once again printed, printed this folded, so printing's fold so we can bend it out so it's actually larger than eight inches so we can print on an eight inch print but this is the, the height there is one and a half inches so that's the new bed uh, which holds insulation so I'm gonna put rock wool insulation I should probably get 30 to 60 percent energy savings on the bed yeah that's 3d printable so I guess it's a nice okay um I don't know let's see on the yeah on the tube cell frame I, I guess that Let's get, uh, you said it's eight inches. Um, yeah. And the piece out front, I figured keeping it with lower pie count and simpler would be, you know, probably better to start with, but uh, yeah, I guess it's... Yeah, I mean, you don't need that. I mean, for the first print, don't worry about the insulated bed, I would say. Just get yeah. thing with ring. Um, but, yeah, I do like the idea of the, I must say, just to emphasize, so this control panel... Um, the new thing on that is through these ridges and rails on the side, it maps in through the metal. So it's very convenient what to mount it. Uh, that, I think, is a great one. Yeah, uh, uh, some of the control panel work, that, that does look nice, having a more modular um, yeah. Yeah, 3D printed parts for that. Yep. Nice. Um, yeah, I think I'm pretty close on, on the assembly. I'm trying to figure out how to... Um, use some of the universal parts as much as I can to get that bed uh, high up and um, see how that, that reaches. Um, I think, oh well, I turned, that's thought I guess it's good. I was looking at the cat trying to fit, uh, meant to check what the extruder was in those designs because I was looking at your more recent cat designs. Um, I assume that's a, that's a more modern extruder uh, that you've modeled there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, uh, uh, for the simple, I took uh, the Titan Arrow, but that's, you know, Titan is going to be as much of the printer itself, so, um, yeah, do a simple one. Actually, some yeah, yeah, go ahead. I was taking some quick measurements out of some of that just to see. I, I noticed that basically it looked like you just put it, the height of it in the rack and all that, it looked like it was to get the uh, hot end above the, the frame in case there's any issues with that, although it it looked like it cleared that a little bit, and I think that was on purpose. And uh, that that's part of the distance to the, um, yeah, to the bed. So I didn't want to change those those brackets too much as those, I figured that was part of the design, and that was the height to get the, 
the extruder up uh, up of the metal frame on in, in the case on the cat on yours and on my I guess that the two frame I don't know if it comes it, it could potentially come close to that I haven't even put in the in stops those new in stop uh, clips yet but um, to see the distance of where stuff hit. I, I, I reworked that so I could move things around and see where everything actually uh, stops, and things like that. So, um, but uh, one of the extruder, uh, what it is, I'll have to find. Um, I guess it's the Titan Arrow is the, is the simple one. That's why I, I sent you that email the other day about the, uh, the, the potential parts that you have. Um, All right. Right. Figure out what that extruder is and okay, for just the, try to check measurements on how that will yeah, fit. Yeah, the one that you want will have this. We're actually, I, I want to build this out. Actually, William has come. Um, he's been building this thing. So, uh, simple extruder. Um, you've seen this in picture for general wiki. Uh oh. Let's see, can you guys hear me? Uh, my, you just couldn't an update on my end, it's probably my Okay, so connection. simple extruder, this is what you want to be looking at, Abe. So there's a nice dock here um, of this thing. This kind of a simple MK8 style extruder, and William has had really good success with that for like, I mean, he got like one clog over like two years, and uses that printer all the time. But it's a very simple one. It looks like this. Also, these are the parts. So take a look at the page. Um, basically, the heat block is a simple so aluminum that you can you can uh, drill holes in, tap. Uh, so yeah, this is and this you have a mo stepper motor, a stepper motor like a heavy duty one. Well, you can get a regular little stepper motor like for eight bucks. And then if you print the parts, you, you have the drive wheel, spring. The aluminum block and the here block, so just a few bucks of parts if you just make this yourself. So that will be really uh, proud of it as a thing that people can make uh, pretty simply. Very simple design. Looks pretty well. So that's that's like an MK8, you said? Yeah, it's MK8 style, yes, that's, that's what you are. Okay. Have. Just the motor yeah. and then the front yeah. thing which clamps the, the filament. And the nozzles, I, I guess I don't know what standards for that yeah, for the it's, nozzle. It's probably a slightly smaller nozzle. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, the right standard is 0.4 millimeter, so just use a 0.4 millimeter on that. That's perfect with the regular it's small, probably small heater block. Mm -hmm. It's changeable, right? Change, it's changeable, changeable to anything. You can probably, yeah, you can probably get up to, up to 0.8 if you print very, very slowly. Um, but yeah, like point four is. Yeah, and of course you can use larger nozzles, but you're gonna get limited pretty quickly by how much heat you can put into that. But you can still put a uh, volcano block on there, or even well, on this one too. You can put super volcano on it too. So uh, it's just a matter of yeah. how much power you give into heater block. Because if you've got a solid heater in there, with mm -hmm. the only limit is this is 1.75 millimeter filament with direct drive. So unless you go to some gear down. Like planetary gear down for a little stepper motor, like we're gonna do in camp. Uh, you gotta do a little little uh, gear down if you want to do three millimeter filament, but for 1.75, a little one like this looks well. Okay. Yeah. So that's in for feet printer extruder, and that would go well with D3 sun. Yeah, I guess this two would change. Um, spin parts on those along with the, the with it being uh, on the overhead axis. I suppose it changed the, the actual nozzle or the hot end. It, um, yeah, then you've got to adjust bed height uh, to to match that somehow, which I guess is pretty double. You just 3D print new parts, but yeah, so that's what the geometry of the E3 simple looks like. I just noticed I just downloaded this, but I noticed I didn't put that other updated file on to the wiki. So I should do that. That's This is what's on the wiki right now. Uh, but yeah, you're right. Uh, also here was you mentioned, Abe, this, this uh, 
call the beta x and call this one. Well, actually, how do you, what do you call that? Um, typically in the Prusa configuration, which is, this is more like Prusa configuration, this is called x typically. But the x axis, as you said, you want it to be vertical because, yeah, it's, it's if you mount it flat against this one, yeah, that would be more stable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unless you're basically you're talking about adding a. And a second Z up, yeah, a second Z on the other side. But, um, yeah, well, yeah, actually, it's still like, like it, even if you do add the second Z, you still want to put it the way you suggested because I mean it's just more stable. So, I guess some of the earlier Prusas are kind of that way too, I guess. So, that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's so, why I mean, if you look at Prusa, the this X axis stays vertical. It's um. Yeah, I'm mean, to to get the details of what how it would would torque and twist upon inertia. You have to sim, do some simulations because it's kind of hard to picture that. Um, yeah, I may be able to do something in that line with fusion. Yeah, yeah, which would be good. Um, okay, well, it's starting to one inch and two inch. Yeah, yeah, uh, two inch. Yeah, two inch and one inch would be more useful. And here. Um, What's the point about? What I was going to say. Okay, never mind. All right. Um, interesting thing is, and. In practice, like the way the axis is, you can stack multiple ones, not not too many multiple ones, but you can definitely do like one back to back to do it more strong if you double it up. And then again, you, you're you are trading off being okay. Now you have another second axis, which is different than okay, say you do a single axis that's of a larger rod size. Uh, it depends on what you want to do. If you if you want to have less parts, use the larger rods. If you don't have large parts, use two of the small ones. But every time two of the smaller ones will take you longer, because if you're you're working with more parts typically. Uh, so a tree has many leaves or many apples on it, right? And that's nature. Uh, there's redundancy here. If you're building that, you'll notice that. One axis is easier than two in practice, just for scaling purposes. So yeah, but you can do if you just are limited to all these small parts, and that could be a particular use case. If you're just limited to all the small parts, just start stacking and doubling up a bunch of these axes, uh, two, four, eight. And you're like, of course, it's going to get uh, it becomes an accounting problem, time problem at that point. Okay, so side note. Anything else? Yeah, you know, with the with the tube style, Ryan, uh, you mentioned stacking. Um, that I was thinking earlier that, that the advantage of having the access access kind of outside on top mm -hmm. the, the volume inside, but it's almost you could make a smaller frame, and that might be stiffer yet. And mm -hmm. you know, I don't know how the performance of those would be, but uh, that that might be stackable or, or um, you know, in some fashion for multiple small printers mm -hmm. um it's yeah. stiff enough uh for the speed you want to operate but, yeah yeah there's a lot of i mean just a ton of varieties we can be talking about so it's it's important just to get get some experience with one and then how did that emerge kind of naturally you emerge to say hey we can do this and we can do this really nicely so a lot of kind of learning comes from yeah see how it works in practice yeah it definitely will work which is saying yes, you can use a smaller frame if you use the overslung axis allows you to use a smaller frame while getting the same kind of print volume. So that's the advantage. You can have more stability because the frame is smaller and wobbles less. Yeah, I assume that the concept of stacking is a little harder because you're operating a bunch of printers at once and so there's gonna be different vibration issues and probably wanna to try to yeah, have good framing and maybe isolation between them or something. But I mean, I see a lot of people that just come on shelves and a lot of 
mm. for sure, and all these other companies do it that way on building. But, um, yeah, the way I share share that so you can, in your log, share that document. Because okay, so in your log, I can take a look at this doc, but I can't see it larger unless I do this. Uh, if you want to share an added link so people can comment in there or something. Inside the see doc. which document. Are you talking about my, my working document? Yeah, uh, yeah the one pictures. Yeah. yeah, I can minute or format. There's an edit link on the left side of the screen. I, I need to format it somehow. Oh. I can oh. figure out how to do that better. It's, oh, I see. it's over on the left. I just need to fix huh. the I need to fix the formatting on oh, that. Um, I think the a yeah. right uh, some HTML some HTML on that would fix it. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. We got a lot of pretty pictures there. That's nice. Um, shows kind of how design thinking is going. That's good. Yeah, I also do it for for notes and, and taking measurements and stuff, so I can remember what. Uh, yeah. Well, since I can't even remember from one day to the next or something. You know, uh, yeah, definitely, definitely. That's that's useful because helps you build on what you have before. Because otherwise, you know. I think that Google Docs are a convenient for that. Really good invention. Yeah, yeah. A lot of the collaborative stuff is is since we're doing everything remote, the collaboration. You know, we only have a few people that, that kind of makes collaboration low. But yeah, mostly it's the software because we're remote. So um, yeah, the software is what kind of limits our collaborative power. Google X seems to be the best, one of the easier things for that so far. Yep. All right. Um, cool. Anything else? Ed? No, I think that's into it from now. Um, I'm going to try to work a little quicker on uh, getting the pad uh, more thorough. I think on the on the PC, I'll have more time. I think in the next month or so. so. Um, move a little quicker on that. Try to get something actually built um, pretty soon. It's nice to have something in it. Uh, hopefully, I'll just get some, some material to do some testing to if necessary. Um, it'd be good to get some PC and maybe just test certain uh, possibilities on that. <clears throat> yeah. So. Okay. Um, that sounds good. So one thing we can try, do you want to go with the three printed corners on the first run? Or do you want to get the PVC corners off the shelf? No, I think we want to do the printed ones, right? Because we want that we'll fine geometry, fine geometry. Um, yeah, I thought, okay, in the print ones, uh, the, the, the redesign, those are the ones that are flush with the PVC on the outside, Dodi. Yeah. So, yes. yeah, I think, I think we definitely need those because that helps with clearance on yeah. yeah a bunch of uh, positioning of the clamps and so on. So yeah, I think I think that has to be the printed ones. Yeah, yeah. How far um, are you from? Thinking, when, when do you think you'll finalize the frame way of all looking? Because I mean, if you uh, send parts, I can send you those, but I need the final file. Yeah. So let's see. Yeah, I need to. Um, I think most of the STLs are gonna see the. So I need to start creating a, a bomb list of some of those parts and make sure they're all final. Um, yeah, they're, they're most of those good. The 3D corners, I think those are, are okay as far as I know. They haven't been tested. Uh, they, I think they're long enough and hopefully they, they print strong enough and everything. So those I think are final. Mm -hmm. um, oh, interesting. They put them. The frame on the inside as opposed to the brackets being outside. Oh, the XY on the inside of the carriage, yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. That, that's, yeah. The, I the design the length that they keep trying to keep the rod length the same. Mm -hmm. And that's how it lines up. Yeah. The, uh, the X axis between the carriage, so. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Uh, and you're not using the Y paralleling, auto Y paralleling piece. 
Caroline piece, I couldn't understand the audio. You that? Yeah, the, the odd parallel piece, uh, exactly the small carriage on here. Remember what I was talking about? With oh, the Justin piece. The extra. Yeah. Yeah. So you had, yeah, you had a second small piece on the end. Yeah. And that's to align it more. Yeah. Well, the rods slide in out of that piece. It's not, you can't see it in the picture unless you're thinking about what's actually happening. But the, the, that piece there would be like carriage where the rods slide in out if, you, if your frame is in parallel. So you still have the, the end piece. So what you have here, put the end piece in, slide it in a little bit, and then put your adjustment piece, which is essentially a half carriage piece with bearings inside. So the rods slide in and out. So if there's any non-parallel between the biases, you don't get any binding. Okay, that's interesting, yeah. Okay, I think I understand that. that so look at those. The yeah, yeah, take a look at, take a look at my... Um, no way. Take a look at um, 1902 and 1904, and think about what's going on in there. So the last piece yeah. there is the half carriage piece. Yeah, the X that would mean the rods um, could be a different length up there. Which yeah, and they can actually uh, stick out. Um, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah, that's looking good. So keep going. Yeah, because like, a lot of it I know is, is assembly and making the assembly um, easier because the, it looked like the documentation before the rod length was kind of important to being used to align things, but um, we can align it better. Than... Yeah, you can, but at a point, I mean, you can possibly do as well if either, but if you do, if you try to do as well the way you have it right now, you have to be very, very precise. So, that's what I'm saying, if, you, oh, okay. if you, you're not going to spend the time on that, or you don't, you want that to be something that you don't need to spend a lot of time on, and do the way that does it for you. So that's, I mean, that's the trade out there. Yeah, yeah, that seems like a good feature then, because a lot of it, it, it better be easy of assembly and way for people to not have to worry about the okay. minor details. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's all, essentially, it makes it self aligning. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try to, uh, to add that then. That, that does yeah. make more sense. It's an uh, extra piece, but it's, it's more than one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there, um, let's see, that's a, a new feature or so. Do you have some documentation written on that somewhere as well? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there's at least, there's got to be at least, hold on, let's see what we have at, at uh, on your log or, um, let's see. It would be on D3-1902, because that's the first place that's done. Um, let's see, how can I gather this? there. Um, D3, but there's got to be a note there. So, printer, printer proper, um, it would be under my axis, so let's look at Working dock. I would look first at a working dock. Um, Change log. No, I don't see, don't see what I wrote too much about it, but uh, I say in the change logs that we did a lot of auto parallel on the y axis. Um, let's see, if we actually click on the, on the printer itself, does that pay of anything? No. Yeah. It's documented, so maybe. 
you build a documentary, we just have that. Uh, that. Yeah. Mm. Well, you know, the process for, for doing that and get a manual at some point, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Or even took a pictures of 1904 um, or 1902. Now I've just got these ones of the parts, but I want to see a final picture here. Mm -hmm. We'll do that. Yeah. Okay. Um, sound good. So we'll get that document up there. But it's a CAD, so uh, someone's looking at the CAD's got to think about it. What's going on? Um, I think I mentioned one of the, the meetings that, well, I did explain in the meeting, but, um, actually, a, a thing to do would be to, here's an explanation, because I did, do, I'm not sure you were at the meeting, but I did go through a, a detailed explanation of that when I was showing the file, uh, so we can do a, a point to clip of the YouTube recording to show, okay, here's how this works, because I did explain it before, we can also take a clip of this a video from this meeting, too, or, didn't talk about yeah, that much. probably mm -hmm. in a previous meeting recording, uh, um, the, the the audio has been kind of rough sometimes. Oh, yeah, and yeah, for yeah. those recordings, those those recordings are still a little uh, the that way too. Whatever that yeah. software issue is, that yeah, I still don't know what the issue is. Because I actually got uh, a different computer, and the exact same thing is happening on the computer. So there's some weird thing out there oh. somewhere. Oh. It's software. Um, I had some of that on mine when I was recording too, and I think it worked well better when I used OBS, but I've been making different changes to my other settings, and oh. you know, if you change certain things, that gets a little confusing. But OBS, for some reason, I, I think it did work. It, it is a more popular uh, recording okay. and streaming okay. Uh, studio. Okay, maybe but, uh, I got it uh, It's documented, but. Um, but, uh, there's play, like, it's a little more complicated, but it, I figured it out, and I had some recordings that worked well, as long as I kept the setting the same, everything, and mm -hmm. it, it just, the, the audio system in Ubuntu does it a little confusing. Uh -huh. and, yeah, I mean, uh, do OBS, because, yeah, OBS is much more, much more popular and much more powerful, actually, so yeah, maybe, just go right to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good suggestion, so I'll, I'll take a look at that, maybe. Maybe for next meeting or such. Okay, sounds good. Okay, so let's continue. Uh, Eric, uh, do you have any comments? Are you, are you back there? Yeah. So um, I've been getting ready to work on um, the Arrow Titan extruder. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't really want to rotate the uh, Y axis, I guess. Um, so I'm just going to modify the interface plate um, so it has the, the bracket right on it. Um, so I think I'm going to just build it from, uh, from scratch and cat, um, should be pretty simple mm -hmm. to, uh, make the, the plate and that little bracket mm -hmm. part. Okay. Um, I was looking at a little bit on the... Okay. Uh, question for you. So you're saying keep Max's axis vertical, right? That's, that's your point? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. So, um, I do like the magnetic box. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh, so wondering, so I guess with the magnets, you want to like slide them off. So having um, kind of just plastic protrude in some of those spots in the um, mm -hmm. kind of like the interface plate that I found, that probably would be ideal for the for the magnets because then you'd have to bowl, right? Kind of have to be all magnets or um, or not. Not sure what. What you're referring to. One thing I, I'll mention is when you design it, just make sure the magnets are away from the fans because you have seen that the print cooling fan, you know, you know that issue. The magnets actually mess with the fan and the fan just doesn't work well. So, yeah. So, do, would it be a good idea or a bad idea to, um, instead of having magnets in every position, having um, some plastic kind of projector? Mm -hmm. to fill in but the so the corresponding hole would add stability or um, that mess with no because as long as okay. the parts are printed well 
like you can even have like uh, when you think about how little blocks snap together that's the kind of idea yeah but the thing is just have enough magnets so if you are printing high speeds like 300 millimeters per second that your extruder doesn't fly off so you have enough magnets at least six okay uh the bill is there like even like four magnets, I think would be adequate, but they gotta be really parallel to each other. They're, if they're slightly misaligned, they're not actually flush face to face. The magnetic hole is much weaker. So just, just as long as you get a good magnetic hole, uh, make sure you get that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So my um, familiar with FreeCAD isn't um, that great. So I was having a little bit of trouble doing the modifications, but um, it'll just be kind of a good practice um, to try to build that yeah. in the next month. Yeah, build it from scratch too. That's, uh, that's a good exercise because I'm noticing, if you see, for example, my angle right here, that thing is butchered. I went to it, tried to edit it and some of the old features. You kind of have to keep really good track of what you, what you do step by step in order for you to understand what you did. So sure. <laughs> if that's not documented in someone else, is a hard time on the engineer in your file. So you, you can feel free to start from scratch, too. Yep. So um, that's uh, what I'll be working on yep. uh, for the hardware stuff. Um, yeah, I got in contact um, with some people involved in what's called the Fuchins Project, mm -hmm. which uh, is trying to open source um, kind of genetic material. So that's kind of my alley and mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the stuff, you know, I've been thinking about. So that's uh, kind of interesting tangential uh, work but um yeah, we'll try and do some of that stuff and uh kind of update you as stuff comes along yeah if, uh, free genes are better than proprietary genes is all i gotta say um because part of that betterness is the idea of transparency and accountability because genes of course is gonna get out there but the more you have that privatized and the secret the worse it can have potential negative effects, so yeah, definitely transparency is good. Yeah, yeah the um, patents and the kind of like institutional ownership, a lot of the stuff is uh, kind of a major obstacle for yeah. um, a lot of the stuff that people are trying to do. Yeah, mm -hmm. definite uh, frontier of freedom uh, because. Uh, what's the, I mean, right now it's like and there's some ridiculous stuff like people are actually patenting stuff they find in the wild yeah I mean, it's, it's yeah, crazy it's, that's that's like yeah it's not a good situation <laughs> it's insane uh but yeah that's how the world works right now so so the more people get involved from a transparent point of view more uh people you know better the situations yeah uh, so um and on the wiki just kind of off and on um, but I do work on uh, open wetware wiki and um, I have my site so I can add some links to my logs so that, yeah. um, I'm publishing stuff but it's sometimes in different places so, yeah, um, yeah, yeah link to you know if you do work somewhat link to link to that because that's relevant yep so that's what's been going on here um, and uh, yeah some parts uh, um, that Extra parts, the fan and the sensor um, name, and I'm waiting for the the main um, Titan arrow stuff. Yeah, yep. Sounds good. Okay, yep. thanks. Thanks for the update. So yeah, we'll continue um, progress. And I think that's it for the meeting. Anyone else uh, last words before we? Hey, Martin. Um, yep. Can I ask something? Yeah. Um, sorry, so there's like a handout feature in this thing. Um, so it says on the homepage uh, that to pay position, and you're supposed to log on to the meeting to find out more. I don't know if I missed that during the first ten minutes or something. Oh, where? where Did you say anything about that? Um, on Open Source Ecology homepage, uh, that says you're offering a one-year pay position. Where's that? Um, Sourceology.org. Yeah. It's like coming up. It's talking about the fellowship, right? Is that what we call it? Fellowship. That was from from last year. What? 2018. But, but it's been. Uh, is that continuing this year as well, right? I mean, it's just um, an update. 
No, we're we're not really doing the fellowship this year because I mean we're, we're still one of the lessons oh, there okay. was we're still we couldn't make it work. You know, we yeah. run some workshops and people weren't signing up. Um, yeah, we're still getting the technology and business model oh, based to that. It's on the wiki web web page. When you go to the main wiki page, wiki, page. Yes. yeah, oh, it does say 2008. You're right, 2018. Sorry. Yeah, it's still, it's just still there. It says we are offering a one year long paid fellowship. Yeah, so, that was last year. And the people that we had sat out, so yeah, it just didn't work out. I had to let them go after like two months. Uh, yeah. We really just weren't get people signing up. Uh, we're finding that it's definitely challenging to, to teach this, so we gotta improve how we teach and, and the products as well, so that we yeah. love the model. You know, that's, but yeah, part of this is, you know, the DVD just, so these final refinements, it's, it's the question to get it to a really solid thing. I mean, that from 99% to 100%, it's a lot of work. Or, you know, like, say, 90 to 100, it's, it's, um, it's taking, well, uh, taking some time. So I about, like, it's not even too early to think about next year. Like you were saying, maybe have um, the summer of design type stuff going on again next year. Like, really, uh, more people, I more. Effort. Yeah, I think. Well, right now we're just doing a nine-day thing this year. But next year we're looking at probably something uh, uh, between one and three months. So just just get it longer and longer, and get it stable, stabilized. But, but I think it could be realistic to something that like uh, the whole summer if we could do that. that yeah, would like be what ideal. you what you used to do. Like that's like a great thing that's happening. Isn't that what happened? Yeah, I mean, at the same time, we're making any money on it or anything, so it, it's it's like uh, you got to think about sustainability. Is there actually a, a model that that's sustainable behind that? So, I mean, at that time, it wasn't really sustainable. We had, you know, we're still kind of riding on money that we had from the foundations back from like, 2013. So, uh, I mean, that's part of the deal. You got to offer a good program and charge for it. Uh, somewhere the revenue's got to happen. We're going at the thing of bootstrap funding where it's like, hey, you can go for foundation and all that. That's pretty really unstable, so we're trying to do it where we're doing bootstrap enterprises a way to do it. Uh, so that's, it takes well, time to do that. Bootstrap enterprises, I mean, it's, uh, the people are making their own enterprises and paying no, bootstrap. No, I mean, we're saying bootstrap means that as opposed to someone drops a bunch of money in your lap, you earn it as you go along. So, yeah. yeah so that you're not lying the fact that, okay, is that person going to give me that money next year, right? I mean, that's what happened in, in 2013. I got the shuttle fellowship and it lasted two years. And what, what, what happened after that was gone? You know, kind of, huh. some way, kind of, you kind of crushed because... If only we was getting a lot of so many people. So many, so many people went through there. Colt and stuff. I lost contact with him. And there was, like, so many people. But it was a normal potential. We didn't stay connected. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people that come through, but, you know, a lot of people are, you know, they're students, they're different positions, depends, yeah, it can work, but, yeah, it's just, it's, you can't just make it happen all of a sudden, it takes time to build it up. But, like, um... You've seen some of the stuff that you're doing, right? That I'm doing? Yeah, I mean, I, how, you know, yeah, how, but how that is, you have a bunch of people to work together and make it last. I think there's <clears> so much potential with open source ecology, like, if oh, stuff absolutely. gets done... Crowdfunding start me in. Like when people see results on the Facebook pages and stuff, they'll absolutely, start to absolutely, absolutely. Like, um, do stuff. Then money will roll in. Really? No. Well, not quite. I mean, it's an exaggeration, but it seems like it's not that far off. Because like it's people do donate off. when they see stuff happening. Right? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I think I think there's gonna be a major, major spike in uh, in activity with the sense of challenge. So okay. that's gonna be huge. Because it does seem to work pretty well, do like uh, crowdsourcing and... It does, like, you know, like, uh, we did Kickstarter twice, we got like 65,000 first time, like 120k the second time. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 you know, you, to get money, you do something decent with it, and then you got to get more money, so... It's, yeah, but like, if there's people on site putting in labor hours, they do the crowdfunding, do it, like, it seems like you just put them together. Yeah. You can get people who are mostly volunteer. When we do make money, then we sort of dip it up. There's a dip on Like, there's got to be a way to do that. It's just got to go. Away. I'm trying to make it work out, so yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying to solve that. Okay. Yep. 
Um, yeah, yeah. So let's let's leave that back now. Um, what's you know, what's the best thing to say about this whole topic? Uh, I I still say the good old enterprise, where uh, for us the mission is that we develop the enterprise and that many people can run it either in the family or with. So as soon as we get the the revenue model stabilized on doing three printers, that's a that's a big cash all right. So just taking the, the product to the fish line and send up and to put around that. I mean, it's it's not a new concept or anything. It's just execution, just the rigor and steps it, it takes to get there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But the thing is, it's like yeah, enterprise. So it's that's the way to go. If you gotta think about selling, as opposed to okay, you, you, otherwise you're depending on somebody else for a long time. So uh, advantage and disadvantages to each path. How to do it. Well, definitely, it's like, you know, as you see the history of OSC, we had a major, major spike up in, you know, 2013, you know, 2011, you know, that we have Lake got put on the map, you know, huge, huge interest, sparked and all of that, and, and after that, it's, you know, there's a lot of activity, and now it's about the long haul where I mean, we've got some ambitious goals to do, and it's not easy, so it's going to take time. And, uh, that's where we're at in the end of the long haul. But I think things are coming into shape. Well, you talk about bootstrapping. I'm just thinking, like, suppose you get people down there, like a minimal budget, people basically pay to be there. They're going to learn things, they're going to live in a nice more environment from there because it's like a nice, right. warm place. Yeah. But they have to be there, they have to pay for the fuel and food and everything. Right. But then, as people are there, they do projects that we do their own crowdfunding. Like, so as you do something that's like um, the golf cart, it's yeah. a usual project, but it's still a project that fits in pretty well with open source technology. Yeah. And then you can sell it afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's some of what we're but, but to But to bootstrap it is people actually paid to come be there. Like, students actually paid to come be there. Well, or it's like, like, we'll think. Like, so that way you don't have much, you don't need much money. Bootstrap it with minimal money yeah, I mean, that's that's exactly the worst so, but yeah, yeah, we yeah. Need yeah. Need yeah. To you know there because people will come i'm pretty sure if you have a project and this facility that people live in yeah. every year there's an enormous number of people just go they just have degrees and everything and they just waste their time doing nothing stuff like that right and because they don't want to be in the city or they don't they need a summer job or something like it I mean, what you're uh, describing is pretty much exactly it. Yeah. You, you have people that, that pay for an immersion learning experience, and somehow all the economics have to work out. So that's then you have to. No, have but it's not necessarily being taught by a teacher, though. That's the thing. Because if you make it a workshop where they're supposed to learn and they're paying for the experience, then that gets complicated to organize, and they have to pay more. But if And it tends to be shorter. But if it's like people go to work on a project and bring in their own funding on the farm. You know, like suppose you say it's a golfer. We have to pick project. I think it has to be reasonably, reasonably good. If people come and make one project, they're not going to be very good projects. But you suppose you say it's the golf cart. Come yeah. work on the golf cart. But like we did that with the 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 soil mixer to some degree. To some degree, and then then you have to balance that by the amount of time. It takes to do that, the amount of resources it takes to do that, right? So, so everything has to work out. But I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it's pretty much exactly what we're trying to do, right? We're saying, yeah, like we can do it for a more extended period of time, so it could be more project-based. It has to be very interesting. It can be just like, oh, you just got a space. Uh, I'm not sure how yeah. well that would work. You have to have, no, you definitely have some structure, right? So you got to yeah. combine some form of structure, and you have to have some infrastructure, you have some people to, you have a bunch of people that need some staff to have that, like, uh, you know, some people who are, so it's not just me or Katarina, it's, uh, we need some staff on site, so it all... Like, what's a bottleneck, then? So the bottleneck is the wetter one. Uh, okay. Okay. So if you're, if you're asking for a bottleneck, I would ask you this. Sit down and start writing down exactly what you're describing and put the numbers to that, such as, okay, this is the, the revenue model, this is how much people are paying, this is how long they're saying, this is, this is so much, you know, 
uh, describe as much as you can and you get more of that out there. But it starts with a plan. What is the model exactly where all the details? I mean, it takes some thinking, right? And it takes some execution. So, because I would ask you, well, if it's so easy, I would ask you, okay, well... Not only it's easy, but then the key feature being offload on the people who are there. Like, yeah. A lot of the responsibility for bringing in money and everything else could be offloaded on them. Because they're actually really talented people in many cases. They're like, they've got four-year degrees and, like, pretty grown up at this point And, you know... Yeah, well, I agree with you, but but I mean, the, one of the challenges you run into there, the people that know how to get money like that, they are typically probably doing it themselves. See, that's what that's. that's I think there's a large contingent that's not because they don't have a facility. And they don't have like that. Like your capital is the facility, so that way, it's like we're talking about capital. So you can show. Yeah. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. The 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 facility helps. Now the next thing is okay. What exactly are people trying to do? Because when I mean, you think about it, that's exactly what we did. Say like yeah. 2010, 11, 12. We had a whole bunch of people. It didn't work that well. Didn't work. Eh? Not that well because it takes real skill for somebody to bring people to bring money in. I and mean, we had a guy who we actually hired explicitly for fundraising, and I was spending more paying him than he, than you know, basically break like even. So, so it's like uh, it takes real skill. And, and the, the surprising thing that we've learned over the years is that. Um, well, yeah, of course we can find those people, but you end up finding out that a lot of people that do have those skills that allow them to do that are working themselves. I mean, that's, that's one of the surprises we found, because um, you just don't find a lot of people that can do that. And to be the kind of people that want to do that are the people that, that are not able to do it, you know? So, yeah, it's, it's a challenge. It's a challenge of, of how skilled people are. And I can tell you that if you get a, you know, if you get a four-year degree in a school, yeah, that's even, I, I kind of call it a liability even, because you definitely don't get taught to think in an entrepreneurial way. It's, yeah. it's, there's real challenges to what you get taught in school compared to being like really useful and entrepreneurial in the real world. So that's one of the challenges we're talking with. It's like the, the good people to find to, to come here, it's it's not that easy. So, But I, uh, I think one of the things to, like you, I take a long term, one of the strengths to go out there is you take a long term view. But to accumulate people, one of the things that's been missing to, yeah. to make but I think You know, I think we're seeing that. We're, we're seeing that, hey, over the, you know, we've run workshops and we've run these immersion camps. Yeah, people are willing to show up. So we're saying, yeah, let's do that and let's do it more. So we're doing just a little bit this year only because there's two main things happening. And that is, one, I'm writing a book, I'm writing a book, and two... We're going to get this amazing, this challenge that I mentioned, the incentive challenge, that is going to be big. I'm going to a bunch of time to that. Uh, that's going to be a huge thing where we're saying, here's all the resources to coordinate a whole bunch of people, who, not just to get some crappy development, but a real commercial great product. So that's serious. That's way different than what we've been talking about all the time. We're saying, this is an explicit, dedicated effort, the resources that it takes to do that. To make it happen so so that why is that important because nobody today has really shown that the open distributed enterprise model can work so we need to show that either very clear proof and, and people that people say oh well this method actually works and we could be collaborating we actually have better products because because you know we talk about it a lot but so far you know we collaborate but our products are not really better yeah they're, they're better in some ways but no, we've, we've got a long way to go still, right? So we, it, the point is it takes so much effort to get to that level. That's why everybody says, oh, you can't do that in one source. you got to have a big-ass funder. You know, you got to have your VC capital to do it because it just takes so much effort. Everyone, everyone leaves that. Well, we're still fighting that, but we got to show a great example where we break through that because right now, the cards are stuck against us because nobody believes this is even possible. One of the things that people believe in is that they could even collaborate with each other. You know, there's there's it's a huge, huge, huge it's on the challenge again. Um, it's for yeah. look at um yeah, so look at the hero platform, but the concept is this. You put up a big reward, you have ton of participate in it because it's the incentive is monetary. And People do something that's 
extraordinary. Um, now, if you look at that model, some amazing things have come out of it. Yeah. So, so they never do that. Like, back it's the, the request, a lot of capital to do that. That's right. That's right. So we're saying to the world, yeah, we're going to do that. We'll do it. We'll do it. I need, we're, we're looking at a quarter million dollar price. So, What's the what's the challenge like it's to make some 3d print part or something no it's to make a professional grade 3d printed core that's drilled that a of people when oh. we finish the contest 200 people are going to actually start producing that like for real as it drops so, like if that doesn't work out um like what about announcing like suppose it does take organizational i would still like i don't want to tell you to do things i'm just floating the idea right, right. um but like, to say, okay, this summer, we're gonna go for three months to do this 3D printed core, this drill, that's the big project for the summer. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody's telling me you're gonna pay your own way though. Yeah. And if, if we sell parts, then we're gonna get yeah. money and stuff. And the plan is to sell like a, like 10 core drills or whatever. And turn them out and start selling them on the internet. Well, if you have all just the logistics, the, the technical, just to analyze what you just said, three months, you're not yeah. going to be selling parts on the internet three months. You might do it in six or months or a year. You go with your project. If you already have the design and it's well developed, you can do that. But the point is, it takes time, right? So you have to think about exactly what's going to happen, when and how. So the missing thing, what you're saying is, yeah, we can do that. Uh, we may be able to do it for something relatively simple or something already focused. Uh, but yeah, that's the model we're trying to, to go for. Let's, okay, let's have a bunch of people that we uh, invite for summer, the summer of extreme design build, and go at it um, and see what is out of it. So that's, that's a diesel model that could that could actually work. It could be made into a regular recurring thing, and it it can evolve. And okay, now we succeeded in doing that for a month or three months. Now we, we're gonna start getting ready to accept people like full time stuff like that yeah because it's the two this approach of trying to get people to collaborate over the internet it seems kind of doesn't ever seem to work very well and, and i can kind of see why this stuff have have, and very few people have access to that kind of thing yeah but but you have to get very clear about what's what's the bottleneck the bottleneck's product so the bottom line is that it takes so much effort to do something together and and I would actually argue that uh, the thing that prevents that from happening is not really like the virtual versus real. It's a human culture. Like you'd, you'd think that, oh, just now we can actually just put these people together and it's actually going to work out. Well, from, from first of all, it's, it's much more complicated with a bunch of people and things like that. But the second thing is the missing link is really mindset of people. So first thing that has to happen is people have to believe that such a such a proposition is even possible. And I can make a strong argument that nobody believes that in all day because who is doing it, right? So yeah. I, I would venture to say that the biggest block is that people do not see the possibility that it's feasible and therefore they're not going to step up to, to that game. So some, some somebody has to pay the way for that to say, oh, now it's possible. Just like, you know, when the first... First guy broke the whatever the four minute mile, then like a whole crowd of people did it the next year. That's the same thing. You have to show that it's doable, and then people are are the do it. That's I think that's kind of how people work. Uh, it's it's really like we have our blocks within our heads. So um, I wouldn't agree that it's that all oh, virtual versus real in reality, because you can I think you can make it work, work both ways. Uh, of course, the the physical thing is, you know, that's that cool too, because you can do some really tangible things much more effectively. But um, I don't think that's like the core of the, the block. But like, uh, but we do want to get people here for the summer, next summer. Okay, but like for um for the spiritual for the not the virtual child, for the um the remote collaboration, mm -hmm. people are trying. How do they make their products and stuff? They have to have a printer. And they have to have time to use it. Exactly. They're all divided and to collaborate. Well, that's the trick of challenge. That's that's the uh, architecture that needs to happen. But I can tell you right yeah. now that 350,000 people do have printers already. 
uh, there are tons of people that have printers that are hyperspaces, so, so we chose the code as a drug because it's one of those things that's actually executable. People have access to the printers, and they have access to forget, so, so there's actually some bug beyond that, right? Like, point to any other project. Uh, I don't, I mean, we've kind of been thinking about this, but I don't think there's anything better than a thing like the code as a drug. It's a multi-billion dollar market, it's like a 10 billion dollar market. S small and tiny, and, and, be, and use that like kind of skill set that's really well developed in open source DIY. So we think that's kind of like the right right thing, and it leverages the printing is huge. So, um, but something has to okay. happen where, because because actually, you know, to tell you the truth, the the three D print has already shown that open source absolutely works just like Linux is because all the three D printing today is pretty much based on open source rep project, but nobody really noticed that, and a lot of that stuff turned. It's it's still. I mean, it's distributed in some way, but it's it's kind of centralized in another. Like, for example, if you look at Prusa, they're making 8,000 printers. They're, they're turned to what is, you could call a big corporation. You know? like, it's the people that were the hardcore open source guys. They were the little guy, now they're turning big. And so, so, so a lot of the 3D stuff is um, somewhat collaborative, but it's, and of course, it's, it's opened up a whole new realm of opportunity for a lot of people, including ourselves, because we have those designs and modeling to work with and stuff like that. But uh, people are not really noticing how, uh, partly because the culture, like, there's a lot of redundancy and not collaboration within the rep. Like, there's a lot of, like, stuff that being redone, blah, blah, blah. Like, I can point you some details if you study that. Like, for example, like, nobody today makes a, an optimized 3 mm rubber extruder. It's like, hey, look, we've been doing, like, the printers for 10 years. Why have not anybody doing it yet? You know, there's a lot of gaps. Because people don't really collaborate, but altogether the thing moves fast and the fear is forward. There is enough open source for that so many people can make printers. But it's not it's not super distributed because now there's only a few internet companies, pretty much. It's not like there's hundreds or thousands, it's maybe like maybe like fifty. Uh, so anyway, uh, the case only used to be made that open hardware actually works currently unfortunately nobody believes it. And nobody believed it. It's pretty much its maker bot and yeah. proprietary, like, uh, that kind of showed the whole world that, ah, uh, if you actually succeed, you gotta, you gotta close up and stuff like that. So, um, in general, the attitude is now, uh, there is the business model for a hardware. And it's a big cultural barrier we need to uh, solve. Okay. Well, okay, that's all. And we are gonna, uh, it's just, it's just taking a little longer than we thought. It's an yeah. that so you can tell. I mean, you'll see, like, uh, I, th I think the, the coolest drill chat, I think, will be a remarkable example of that. I, it's going to work really, for Yeah, I think, exactly. I think it's going to be insane. The insane. Ball there with different people and how well coordinated they are and stuff. Just, I mean, it can, it can be done to some degree, but, like... Uh, it's not easy to coordinate, uh, say, a thousand people, which is yeah, what I know. probably That's have what to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you can figure it out, you, you definitely get a lot of points, but... Yeah, yeah. And that's, uh, I think it's quite doable. So, because uh, think about it, but, but look at the, the Helix platform. They actually allow you even to fundraise the cash prize. We're not going to do that. We think we're going to, uh, we're going to get it from various supporters. Because we're going to just go on campaign to do that. But a person with no money can raise money and offer incentive so that the amount of labor that goes into an incentive challenge is typically that, uh, say the prize is one million. The amount of money that the actual effort is probably like a hundred million. So basically people are able to work for like, because that's how people work, they work for like one percent of it. So. Yeah, well that's so, not so, really what we want anyway. No, it's not what we want, but it's Right, but that's that's how we're gonna structure we're gonna structure that out of this and solve a challenge is that anybody can now start this business of which we worked out all details, including marketing and the fact that we're actually gonna to connect to the big box stores and develop them the distribution channels and all of this kind of stuff and so so the big part of that is enterprise development, it's not just a technology development. So it's it's a it's something that I've never seen anything quite like it anywhere else, but uh, I think we're on the right track on that. Okay, well, I hope it works, but I have to say I'm worried. 
It's like there's just a certain there's certain groundedness and it's kind of a the turtle approach instead of the hair approach with do stuff on site with the real team, you know. It seems kind of a little more dependable, but I mean well, I was really gonna sacrifice one. Yeah, yeah, I mean it doesn't mean we're we're not doing that. We're so so definitely we're gonna spawn this uh the incentive challenge, but as far as on site, I mean, we're, we're looking at doing the back picture sign of people here, so yeah, so I think okay, I think, uh, awesome. everyone's gonna win. Well, I'll be around next year, yeah, I'll come to see you next week, I guess. Yep, all right, well, thanks everybody. A uh, little extended discussion at the end, but yeah, thanks, uh, everybody. And it's we'll good. See yeah, well, I mean, one thing to say, just to sum that up, it's like a lot of people ask me this question, I like, why don't you just do this and that? Um, yeah. Yeah. Try it. Uh, yeah, it's not as easy as it is, right? But it's just like so. Um, this, there was stuff happening. To build upon it is all I is all I dream of, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Because so, like you know, I've been a lot of places looking for stuff, and it turns out that the psychology was the only thing that was really going well. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well. <laughs> well bye. Okay. okay. Well, I'll talk to you all next next time. Bye. -bye. Where's my...